Act One of All That Glitters Is Not Gold by John Madison Morton and Thomas Morton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Persona Sir Arthur Lassell Read by Alan Mapstone Jasper Plum Read by L.G. Pug Stephen Plum Read by Todd Frederick Plum Read by Greg Giordano Toby Twinkle Read by Adrian Stevens Harris Read by Jim Hedrick Servant Read by Rapunzelina Lady Leatherbridge Read by Wendy Katz Hiller Lady Valeria Read by Matteo Bracic. Martha Gibbs. Read by Jen Broda. Stage directions read by Kelly Tay. All That Glitters Is Not Gold, or The Poor Girl's Diary, a comic drama in two acts, by John Madison and Thomas Morton. Act One. Scene. Hall in Jasper Plum's house in Bristol. Wide entrance door left in flat, showing a portion of the interior of the factory. Large window right in flat, showing exterior of factory, etc. Entrance right upper entrance leading to Jasper's apartments. Table at back and cheval glass, four chairs. Jasper Plum, Harris, and servants discovered. Well, Harris, are you nearly ready? Is everything in a state of suitable splendor? Yes, Mr. Plum. Harris, if you could contrive to drop the E's, Mr. Plum, and pick up Yes, Mr. Plum. You would very much oblige, Mr. Plum. Yes, Mr. Plum. Thank you, Harris. Now be gone, all of you, and mind you receive Lady Leatherbridge with all the elegant ceremonial I've been trying to instill into your thick Somersetshire heads for the last seven weeks. Silence, above all things. Yes, Master Plum. Yes, Master Plum. Plum. Exunt servants and Harris right upper entrance. Work people... Left exit in flat. At length the great, the happy day is arrived. This very morning, my boy, Frederick William becomes the husband of the Lady Valeria Westendley, the real daughter of a real earl. Without a penny, to be sure, but with the reversion of a title to her children, so that I, Jasper Plum, the head of the house of Plum, am probably destined to be the grandfather of a peer of the realm. What a glorious wind-up to forty years cotton-spinning! Past ten, I declare, and Frederick William not returned, and that precious brother of his, Stephen, the eldest born of the house of Plum, I'll be bound the idle dog's hard at work still. Stephen, without left. That'll do, lads, that'll do. Here he comes. Enter Stephen, left entrance, flat. In his working dress, patches of raw cotton sticking to his clothes, hair, and etc., he turns right and speaks off. No more work today. A holiday and a crown ahead to drink happiness to the bride and bridegroom. Health to Jasper Plum, and long life to the cotton mill. Workmen shout, Hurrah! Hurrah! Behind. No, there's a nice-looking young man for a wedding party. Stephen, left. Ah, Dad. How are you, Dad? Jasper, right. Not dressed yet? What are you thinking of, you idle dog? Idle? Excuse me, Dad. I was at work before daylight. Work? Daylight? What have you to do with daylight such a day as this? Don't you know that Lady Leatherbridge and her niece, Lady Valeria, will be here presently? Go to that glass, sir. Gaze upon that coat, waistcoat, and trousers including boots and sparrowbills, 
and then tell me is that figure stephen plum or a common cotton spinner out of the hundreds in his employ well and what's stephen plum after all said and done but a common spinner too a common spinner growed rich like his father before him wasn't his father bless the old face of him wasn't he a common spinner too no he wasn't jasper plum was no common spinner he was one in a thousand he was lord lord didn't he used to make the bobbins fly and didn't he card and comb till his face was as shiny red as a brand new penny bit sighing <sighs> oh dad you were something like a man then you was jasper smiling conceitedly well i believe i was rather a good hand but those mechanical types are gone we are now gentlemen speak for yourself dad i'm no gentleman i was and am and always shall be a cotton spinner now don't be unreasonable dad haven't you made brother freddy a gentleman surely one gentleman in a family's quite enough yes frederick william's a pretty fellow a very pretty fellow freddy's been wound on a different bobbin to me freddy's been to oxford college and larnt no end of larning and freddy's been to london and seen no end of lunnin life and if you hadn't preferred living like a bear you might have accompanied him and seen how all the mothers who had daughters to marry tried to get him to marry their daughters even the head of the illustrious house of leatherbridge graciously condescended to accept his proposals for her niece lady valeria westendley the whole affair was moved debated and carried in a week only it was arranged that the wedding should take place here at bristol during the family's visit to clifton to avoid what we call eclat eclat sir dignified well i don't wonder at freddy freddy's a handsome chap and a thorough good fellow and jasper plum's the warmest man in our parts and can put a hundred thousand yellow boys into freddy's breeches pockets yellow boys breeches pocket stephen plum i hope you don't mean to discharge such fearful expressions in the hearing of lady leatherbridge bless you no before them female knobs my grammar'll be as right as a trivet female knobs right as a trivet stephen stephen the sad truth is you've got no elevation of soul look at your associates that familiar illiterate fellow toby twinkle in particular don't abuse toby dad why he's the life and soul of the mill we should all go to sleep if it wasn't for toby twinkle besides he'd lay down his life a dozen times over to serve me i know he would that's very attentive of mr twinkle very but though he may be very great cronies in the mill you might drop his acquaintance out of it what cut toby twinkle why the poor fellow would break his heart no no my friendship is no respecter of places in the mill or out of it alone or for company i'll take toby by the hand for i love him dad almost as much as i love my own brother oh stephen plum you live and die in cotton i hope so i mean to stick to cotton as long as cotton sticks to me jasper taking cotton off his coat cotton sticks to you too much stephen plum i wish you'd stick to cotton dad and get rid of all these fine new silk and satin notions of yours the idea of your idling away your time studying parlez-vous francais and then getting that whacking looking-glass where i seed you making great ugly faces at yourself don't say you didn't cause toby and i catched you at it the other morning ah oh, we did laugh surely <laughs> what you are pleased to call great ugly faces sir were postures and smiles to receive my guests and look at the result behold the transmogrified jasper plum passed into the state of butterfly out of the state of grub a butterfly you i say dad don't you feel a little stiffish about the wings <laughs> butterfly and grub lord love you if it pleases the old heart of you you can turn and be a butterfly bone in a bower but i mean to grub on as heaven made me suddenly serious look you dad winter and summer in work and out of work i can manage to keep five hundred cotton spinners families and all a matter of two thousand poor creatures and every man woman and child among em has helped to make us rich for my part i can't lift a bit to my mouth but i ask myself if any of theirs be empty no no i must live and die among em but what need to tell you so don't they love you and you love them as dear as dear as can be bless your old heart i know you do wipes his eyes 
Jasper, aside and affected. The monster isn't quite a monster all over. Frederick, without right upper entrance. Bring everything into the hall. Here's Frederick William. Enter Frederick, right upper entrance. Frederick, center. Ah, father, good morning. Another to you, Stephen. Shaking hands heartily. Stephen, left. Well, and another to you, Freddy. Jasper, right. Frederick William, where have you been? Ah, I see. Presents for your lovely bride. Frederick, center. Just received by the express train. A rather costly collection. Jasper, right. Quite right. Let the cost of the taste be worthy of the plums. To be sure. I say, Freddy, talking of the taste of the plums, I hope there's a jolly plum cake for the young lady. Silence, you sensualist. You may depend on the quality, father. Everything was selected by my friend, Sir Arthur Lazelle, whose exquisite gout is proverbial. Jasper, right. His friendship, my dear boy, does you honour. Frederick, centre. To him I owe my success in London last winter. In short, I am under infinite obligations to my friend Arthur. Stephen, left. Yes, I'm told your friend Arthur helped you to get rid of twelve hundred pounds in a couple of months. I call that doing the tidy, Dad. Doing the tidy? Doing the noble, sir. Of course Sir Arthur will be here to add luster to your wedding. He tells me I may certainly depend on him. Enter Harris, right upper entrance. Here be Maester Tothersite, a lawyer from London, says he wants to see Maester Plum, particular. Bring him to my study, you hot and tot. Exit Harris, right. Her ladyship's attorney. When I touch the bell, come to us, Frederick William, to put the last stroke of the pen to the jointure. Meanwhile, do endeavour to give that unfortunate brother of yours some idea of how to behave comme il faut before the ladies. Solemnly to Stephen. Come il faut, sir. Exit right upper entrance. Well, Freddy, and so I'm going to see your high-born lady at last, eh? Do you know I feel in a bit of a twitteration? Frederick, right. There is no need for Stephen. Valeria is as amiable as she is beautiful. I may well be in vain of her partiality. I, who have nothing but fortune to offer her, then I should say you are well matched, for I'm told she has got nothing but title to offer you. But think how title helps fortune to move on in life. No doubt, aunt. But it do seem to me that without fortune, title can't move on at all. But title commands fortune by extending connection. For instance, my friend Sir Arthur has already hinted at the possibility of my obtaining some diplomatic appointment at a foreign court i own the prospect warms me well there be no accounting for tastes as for me give me a cottage and a sanded floor in old england afore all the foreign courts in the world ha <laughs> ha now my dear stephen you must be influenced by the great change in our family position you will i'm sure forsake these habits of life leave off personal labor receive company see the world and some day or other who knows but you may marry as advantageously as i who me you be joking far from it think of a wife with a title and a coat of arms well if you will have me talk serious i must tell you freddy i want no title with a wife but the title of a fond and faithful woman and to get such a one I could manage to do without a coat of arms, or without arms to my coat, for the matter of that. By the by, Stephen, I hope the whispers I hear among the factory people are untrue. What do you mean? What whispers? Mm, that there is a certain black-eyed girl amongst them, and that you spoil many a reel of cotton by looking at her eyes instead of your bobbins. What need a whisper in that? Martha Gibbs is the sort of girl any man might look at. I've noticed her, a clever, handsome young creature, evidently full of savoir-faire, and a perfect knowledge of the game. Full of what, brother? She's a perfect knowledge of the game of cotton spinning, and whatever that outlandish word may mean, let me tell you she's full of just that kind of stuff that every man loves in his own sister, 
and honors in his own mother serious i declare serious faith in the virtue of a factory girl yes brother serious faith in the virtue of a factory girl they may talk about discovering this and discovering that but take my word for it we ain't made no discovery yet like finding that poverty and virtue can walk to their humble grave hand in hand together such a girl is martha gibbs ah oh, i've had proof certain of that what that's a secret freddy looking around but if i tell it you will you keep it like honor bright i pledge to you my own then listen for some time gone months now martha gibbs has somehow run a good deal in my head but bless you i took care never to let it out well martha's an orphan poor thing and ain't got one friend in all bristol so dad gave martha a room in the mill to live in just like dad that was well go on my rounds at night to see lights out and all snug in the mill i used to see a candle night after night in martha's room long after regulation hours this surprised me this did so at last i thought of getting atop the opposite wing of the mill just above her window well up i get in i look and there i see loud what do you think how should i know there i see her hard at work at loud what do you think how should i know hard at work writing in a book afore her presently up she gets puts her scribbling things away in her box locks it slips behind her curtain and then <laughs> all dark next night the same next night next night and every night ditto 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 very strange perhaps correspondence with a lover the very thing i feared i couldn't eat drink or sleep for it i couldn't live without knowing the truth so yesterday while she was at work in the mill i opened her door with my ring key her book was on the table i opened it and there i read loud what do you think how should i know confused noise of voices outside left hush i hear her i know her voice within a mile i'll tell you all by and by bell rings right my father's bell i must leave you pray lose no time my dear stephen and for my sake throw a little more care into your dress to-day i wish to present you to my bride as much a gentleman in aspect as you are in heart and soul exit right upper entrance noise of voices again martha's voice again and toby's too and both flinging along this way why what's the matter enter martha left down front hurriedly followed by toby who enters with his back to the audience sparring and hitting out violently with both hands toby left come on one at a time or all at once it's the same to me Ugh, cowards stephen right why martha what's the meaning of all this martha center walking to and fro i cannot speak i refer you to mr twinkle sir retires up center toby turning and showing his nose bloody and mr twinkle refers you to his nose sir stephen crosses to toby i heard angry words something unpleasant has happened in the mill yes i got my nose broken in the mill sparring again martha coming down right to be insulted like this i could cry but i won't oh i wish i was a man crosses to centre so do i if it was only for five minutes just for the sake of seeing you give them one for their knobs all around stephen right insulted you martha martha center suddenly mr stephen plum i'd be obliged to you if you'd pay me my wages and let me leave the factory this very day as if relieved there toby left imitating there stephen right leave the factory you martha no no martha center you cannot stop me you have no claim on me no claim martha but the claim of wishing to be a friend to you that's all martha have you anything to complain of against me no indeed no you have been a kind master but that makes no difference i want to go away i will go away sir but why why martha what have they done to you and who has done it nobody has done it everybody has done it except toby 
taking Toby's hand kindly. You hear? Except Toby. You'll be good enough to bear that important fact in mind. Except Toby. Nobody? Everybody? What do you mean? Now do tell me, there's a dear. I mean, there's a good girl. If you've got the smallest bit of regard for me. But I haven't the smallest bit of regard for you. And so I told them all. Didn't I, Toby? That you certainly did. To Stephen. I'll do her justice to say she emphatically told them all, individually and collectively, that she didn't care that about you. Snapping his fingers. You will drive me crazy between you presently. It's clear, Martha, you've been insulted in the factory. Only let me get in among them. Oh, I've been in among them already. I didn't stop to count how many I'd killed, because when I got this crack on my nose, it suddenly occurred to me that I'd had enough of it. Stephen indicates that he will punish them. Besides, sir, that would only make them worse. No, if you must know, you shall hear it all from me. At least I'll try and tell you. Well, then, ever since this marriage of Mr. Frederick's has been talked about, there's been a dead set made at me. Oh, oh, says one. Mr. Frederick's going to be married, eh? So's Mr. Stephen, too, says another. And then what will become of somebody not far off that's been fool enough to listen to him, says a third. And then they all look at me and look in such a way, don't they, Toby? Yes, that sort of thing. Leering. There's old Sarah White in particular. Sarah's only got one eye, and that squints. So you may imagine the peculiar expression that Sarah throws into that one eye. I couldn't bear it. What do you mean? I said. What's Mr. Stephen to me? I don't care for Mr. Stephen. I don't care for you, Mr. Stephen. Do I? And Mr. Stephen don't care for me. You don't, do you? Stephen bothered. Why? To be sure, now and then, when I've been dressed in my best, you've told me I was a smart girl or something of that sort, just in your good-tempered way. But as for thinking twice of a poor girl like me, you don't, do you? Why don't you say no? Stephen bothered. Why, Martha? I see you don't, and I told him so. Didn't I, Toby? You did. And then they were cruel enough to say I was nothing but... I can't. I won't tell you that. Stephen, furious. I know what they said. They said... Martha, stopping him. You do not know what they said because you couldn't repeat it. The foul-mouthed villains. Cold-blooded ruffians. Old Sarah White in particular. I shall leave the mill with a full heart. A very full heart. I thank you for all your goodness to me, Mr. Stephen. But it's my duty to go, and go I will. No, don't say so, Martha. Do you think I'll let you go, a first-rate spinner like you? Besides, don't I know? Haven't I read? Read? What have you read? Why, I've read, I've read your character, to be sure. That's all, Martha. And now, at any rate, say you'll stop at the mill till tomorrow. Well, I'm sure I wouldn't if I could help it. Disturb a happy day like this. Besides, I long to see Lady Valeria, whom I once knew so well and haven't met for so long. You know her ladyship, Lady Valeria? We once lived and loved like sisters. My poor father was one of the late Earl's gamekeepers. A gamekeeper? Do you know I never see a gamekeeper with his gun and his double-barreled dog that I don't envy him? He died by the shot of a poacher. Oh, that alters the case materially. Retires up left. Lady Westonleigh took my mother and me to the hall, fed, clothed, educated me, and made me Lady Valeria's playfellow. Oh, that I could live or die to show my love and gratitude for that woman. But she died young. My poor mother soon followed her. The Earl took his daughter to London, and I went out to factory work. Bell rings right. Your father's bell. Good day, Mr. Stephen. Good day, Martha. I say, Martha, we may as well shake hands. No great harm in that. Takes her hand. That's as it should be. Don't forget, 
No going away, Martha. What should I do without you? I mean, what would you do without me? No, I mean, what should we do without each other? No, no. I don't know what I mean, but I shall know afore tomorrow, and so shall you. Goodbye, Martha. Why, I don't believe we shook hands after all. I don't think we did, sir. I'm sure we didn't. Shaking her hand again. There. God bless thee. She walks slowly to left entrance, turns, their eyes meet, and she exits rapidly, left entrance. Lord, Lord, how I do love that girl. And now, Toby, tell me, have you done as I told you? Have you watched her narrowly? Do you think Martha cares for me? Toby, right. Well, the result of my observation hitherto induces me to assert without the fear of contradiction, that I haven't come to any decided opinion upon the subject whatsoever. Stephen left. You don't think she loves another? I'm sure she don't, except me. And of course no woman can see so useful and ornamental an article as a nose disfigured in her defence, as mine has been, without feeling an intense interest in the man whose property that nose is. Is. Pshaw. I'd give, ah, I don't know what, to know if Martha cares for me. Toby, suddenly. Then I'll tell you. And not only that, but I'll tell you if you'll be married, when you'll be married, where you'll be married, how many children you'll have, how many boys, how many girls. In short, all about you for as many years to come as you think proper to mention. <laughs> I forgot, Toby, that you call yourself a bit of a conjurer. You may laugh, Mr. Stephen, but I have an inward conviction that in taking to cotton spinning I mistook my calling and that I was born to be a necromancer. Ah, just because you went and seed some conjuring chap at the playhouse six months ago. Conjuring chap? Don't speak in that disrespectful way of the wizard Jacobs, if you love me. Ah, that Jacobs. I dote upon that Jacobs. The style in which he smashed people's watches and changed silver pencil cases into guinea pigs. And then to see him lay eggs. I shall never forget his laying eggs. I could think of nothing else. It quite haunted me. In short, I did nothing but lay eggs all night long for weeks and weeks together. From that moment, I fancied myself a wizard. <laughs> and you're really silly enough to fancy that you can foretell? Anything and everything. Consequently, when anybody wishes to know anything, I say to him, as I do to you, take a card. Presenting pack. Pshaw, my mind's made up. I can't live without Martha. And here comes Dad, so I'll strike while the iron's hot. Retires up left. Enter Jasper. Right upper entrance. Jasper, right. All's done. The papers are signed. The factory folks are perfect in their parts out of doors. The servants are perfect in their parts indoors. I flatter myself the plums will come out rather strong to meet the Leatherbridges. Seeing Toby. Halloa. And pray, sir, what do you want here? Toby, left. Do you particularly wish to know? I do. Then take a card. Presents pack. Jasper drives him to left. He goes out, left entrance in flat. Stephen, coming down left, aside. Now for it. Plaintively. Dad. Jasper, right. You still here? And not dressed yet? Stephen, Stephen, is it your wish to drive me crazy? I'll do that or anything else to make myself agreeable to Dad, because I want Dad to make himself agreeable to me. I want to tell Dad a secret. I'm in love. In what? In love. And I don't mind to tell you another secret. It's with a woman. In love with a woman? Yes, and now you're in for it. I'll tell you a third secret. I want to marry her offhand directly. The boy's mad. His brother's marriage has got into his head and turned it. You marry? And marry a woman, too? What next, I wonder? Don't be angry, Dad. I only want a wife of my own, like my father before me. So you'd very much oblige me if you'd just name the time and keep it. Jasper, right. Indeed. Before I name the time, sir, perhaps you'll condescend to name the woman. 
Stephen left. Ah, now comes the squeege. I say, Dad, you see that hook atop the ceiling? That's just where you'll jump to when you hear who tis. Well, then, the woman I love and want to marry is Martha Gibbs. Now, don't jump. Holding Jasper down. Martha Gibbs. Ha, ha, ha. Come, I like this. There's some character about such damnable audacity. It tickles one to have one's hair stand on end. Degenerate offspring. Do you want to be the death of the house of Plum? Quite the other thing, Dad. I shouldn't wonder if I put a deal of new life into the house of Plum. And do you think I'll ever sanction such an alliance for a son of mine? Never, never. The voice of all your ancestors exclaims, never, never. Then I wish my ancestors would just speak when they're spoke to. Reflect, rash youth. What was this creature, Martha, a beggar, asking charity? No, she asked for wages, and paid you with hard work. And who was she? I asked for her ancestry. She never had any. I asked for her parents. I don't believe she ever had any. Never had a father and mother? Then weren't she a clever girl to manage to do without? <laughs> Reflect like a man, sir, and don't laugh like a horse. I'll turn that intriguing hussy, Martha Gibbs, out of the house this very day. Stephen, agitated. Stop, Dad. You don't. You can't mean that. I do mean that, and I'll do it. Stephen, sorrowfully. No, you won't. You may save yourself the trouble now and the pain afterwards. Martha has given notice. She means to quit the factory tomorrow morning. A pleasant journey to her. Stephen, assuming a tone of determination. I hope so, because I go along with her. What did you say, sir? I go along with her. You, Stephen? Go and leave? Oh, Stephen! Affected. Perhaps it's best it should be so. Long's a day I've seen my father and brother are ashamed of me. Stephen Plum. Reproachfully. And you'd have me marry a fine lady who'd be ashamed of me, too. But I won't. And if you won't have us near you, why, Martha and I must love you far away. And so shall our children far away. Jasper, affected. Well, I'll reflect. Let me have time to reflect. That's but fair. I'll give you lots of time. Jasper, aside. That's a comfort. Stephen, looking at watch. I'll give you five and twenty minutes. Eh? Well, I don't mind making it half an hour. Now mind, in thirty minutes I'll return for your yes or no. If it's no, I must pack up my carpet bag, because I can't go into the wide world without a change of linen. I shall run distracted. Shouts oh! without. Right upper entrance. Ah, those shouts. Her ladyship's at last. Now, Stephen Plum, if you've any lingering love for your half-expiring father, mind your manners. Say as little as possible. And above all, go and put on your new clothes. Don't let the lady see you in undress. Runs out at right upper entrance. Let the lady see me undressed. I don't mean to. Shouts without right upper entrance. Enter the factory workmen, with Toby at their head, all with large wedding favors, left entrance. Lady Leatherbridge, escorted with immense formality by Jasper, then Frederick, and Lady Valeria. Servants in rich liveries proceeding, right upper entrance. Stephen hides amongst the workmen, left. Stephen, left, aside to Toby. I say, Toby, just look at Dad. Ain't he doing the polite to the old lady? My august Lady Leatherbridge. My lovely Lady Valeria, I can only say, that is, I... I say, Toby, there's Dad stuck fast already. Frederick, right center. My dear Valeria, how can I express my thanks to you for waving form and consenting to proceed to church from my father's factory? Valeria, left entrance. Indeed, Frederick, no trace of a factory is perceptible. Every object around blends costliness and taste. Jasper bows to the ground. Frederick and Valeria cross to right at back. Lady Leatherbridge crosses to center. Oh, quite so. And then I quite long to see your people at work. It must be quite a curiosity to see people work, especially when one has never done anything in the world oneself. Stephen, aside. Did you hear that, Toby? Never did anything in the world herself. Toby. Left. I wonder how she set about it. Frederick, right. Your ladyship 
will gratify our workmen by your condescension. They have decorated the factory in expectation of your visit. Lady Leatherbridge, Centre. Well, that's very civil of them. I should like to reward them to distribute some beer, some cheese, and some bread among them, and then I should like to have them scramble for some copper coin. I wish to make a suitable return for the pretty feeling they've got up. Stephen, left. Feeling they've got up. I can't stand the like of that. Back me up, Toby. Toby, left. I will. Stephen, left, advancing. With Toby close to him. You'll excuse me, my lady. Yes, you'll excuse me, my lady Leather. Aside to Stephen. What's her name? Leather Breach? <laughs> Jasper, left sinner, aside to him. Stop that infernal laugh. Toby, aside to Stephen. I say, if his lordship was like her ladyship, what a funny old pair of leather breeches they must have made between them. Jasper, left sinner. Now, Stephen. If you must speak to her ladyship, try and speak like a gentleman. Stephen, crosses to centre. I will. To Lady Leatherbridge. Excuse me, ma'am, but in these parts it's our way to pay working folks for work, and not for feeling. But seeing you never did nothing in the world yourself, we compute it to your ignorance, ma'am. Lady Leatherbridge, right centre, looking at him through her eyeglass. Who is that? What is that? Jasper. Right center. What is it? Why... Turning Stephen over to left. It's a sort of... But your ladyship needn't mind what it is. Fred crosses to left center, taking Stephen by the hand. This, madam, is my father's eldest son, my dear brother, Stephen. Toby, left. Yes, my lady. These are the two chickens, and that's the old cock. Pointing to Jasper, who indignantly silences him. Lady Leatherbridge, left centre. That a brother of yours, Frederick. The information was needed. I should never have guessed it. Fred, left centre. Yes, madam, and a brother I am proud to own. His industry and talent have doubled the productiveness of this large establishment. And if our workmen are the best in the country, it is because they work to show their love for Stephen Plum. Placing his hand on Stephen's shoulder, Toby left enthusiastically. Three cheers for Stephen Plum. Cheers. Hip, hip. Hooray. Hooray. Hip, hip. Hooray. Hooray. Hip, hip. Hooray. Hooray. Jasper crosses to left at back. I must get rid of this fellow. Aloud. Here, Toby, go into the refreshment room and see if everything is ready. Driving him to right upper entrance. Do. It will be an occupation at any rate, and I require a little amusement. Toby, coming down. You do? Then I flatter myself I can accommodate you. Taking Pack out of his pocket, presenting it to Lady Leatherbridge. Take a card. Jasper drives him off, right hand. Martha, left, who has entered a short time before and has joined the factory people approaching and looking at Valeria. Yes, tis she. And how beautiful she's grown. Stephen left, seeing her. Ah, Martha, come here and have a talk with your old friends. Oh no, Mr. Stephen, I dare not. Jasper sent her in a threatening tone. No, you'd better not. Aside. Now then, to astonish the house of Leatherbridge. Aloud. Frederick William, isn't your friend the baronet arrived? Lady Leatherbridge, coming to left centre. The baronet? What baronet? An illustrious friend of Frederick William's, who has promised to grace his nuptials. Lady Leatherbridge, left centre. A man of family. We'll await him, of course. Meanwhile, we'll accept your arm, Plum, to the refreshments. Come, Valeria. Valeria, right, crossing to back. Nay, aunt, I prefer the refreshment of a little repose. I will await your return here. Takes off her bonnet and retires upright. Martha advances to receive it. What do I see? Is it possible? Yes, it is Martha Gibbs, my friend and playfellow, dear Martha. Bringing Martha down left. And pray, who is Martha? 
And who is Gibbs? Jasper, right, trying to intercept. Nobody whatever. There you're wrong, Dad. Gibbs is Martha, and Martha is Gibbs. Stephen retires up left and crosses to right at back. Valeria, left, to Lady Leatherbridge. The child of the poor woman your ladyship has so often heard me speak of. Martha, left. Yes. To Lady Valeria. The poor woman whom your mother sheltered and relieved. The poor child, fed, clothed, and educated by your bounty. Oh, how happy I am that you have not forgotten me. I am glad to find that you have not forgotten me, Martha. No, one may forget the good one does, but not the good that's done to us. Oh, no. Forgive me if I weep. My heart's so full. Stephen, aside. Poor tender-hearted lamb. Jasper, right center, aside. The sly young crocodile. Lady Leatherbridge, left center. Now you mention it, I have a sort of recollection about somebody or something or other, but my nerves won't bear anything like sentiment. There is nothing in the world so unwholesome as sensibility. So once more, Plum, your arm to the refreshments. Enter Toby, right upper entrance. The eatables and drinkables are ready. There's lots of them. And what's more, they're as good as they look. I happen to know it because I've tasted them all. Stephen, right, aside to Jasper. Recollect, Dad, about Martha. You've only got ten minutes left. Be gone, Sarah. Be gone to your toilet. Allez-vous on to your new clothes. Two servants. Lead the way to the refectory. Madame, the honor. Hands Lady Leatherbridge out right upper entrance. Workmen shout, Hurrah! and all exeunt at left entrance in flat. Stephen, right aside. I say, Freddy, you know silk from worsted, you do. Looking at Valeria. Ecod, if you don't mind my having a bus at her, bless you, I don't. Frederick, right. Hush, the moment she's mine, you shall. Dear Valeria, let me prevail on you to take refreshments. Yes, do, ma'am. Just a mouthful of something, and a glass of ale. Valeria, left center. Thank you, gentlemen, but do not think me rude, for I prefer to be left alone with my old playfellow, Martha. Stephen, right. You can't do better, ma'am. A chat with Martha will do your heart good. Come, Freddy, do you go and learn the marriage service out of the book? And I, yes, I'll go and put on new clothes. Come along, Toby. Exit with Toby. Left entrance in flat. Fred kisses Valeria's hand. Goes out. Right upper entrance. Martha. Left. How long it seems since we parted, Lady Valeria. And to think that I should live to see you once more and see you on your wedding morning. In a few minutes, you will be the happy wife of an amiable and handsome bridegroom. For you know he is very handsome. Valeria. Right coldly i really have thought very little on the subject my aunt told me i was poor that mr frederick plum was rich that the marriage would revive the fortune of our house that i ought not to hesitate therefore i did not and in less than a week the marriage was negotiated i must say a week's acquaintance seems to me rather short ah oh, martha the formula of life which girls of rank go through should be better known at a given birthday the schoolgirl lays aside her books to go into the world there she soon meets a man who seems to realize those visions of perfection we all of us indulge she loves but only to be told that the omnipotent voice of circumstances forbids the indulgence of her affection. Another bridegroom is presented. In the wide world she has not one sympathetic bosom to confide in and weep upon. In mere despair she throws herself on his. This is a history of many a happy bride that poverty envies, but should hug its rags for not resembling. Why, Lady Valeria... What words and what a tone! You are agitated, and I declare, a tear. Lo, to her. I am afraid there's some sad secret. No, no, twas but the dream of an hour. The very recollection's gone. 
I must think, I will think no more of him. Of him? Of whom? Anxiously. Of no one. I am the bride of Frederick, and, as you say, I am happy, very happy. <laughs> Martha, aside. She frightens me. Tis plain she loves another. Forgive me, Martha, I am grown so selfish. I talk of my own happiness and have not even asked how I can add to yours. You, who have been thrust into the world without a mother's help, without a mother's counsel. No, not without her counsel, for the very words my poor dying mother said to me are as fresh in my heart as if I heard them now. And do you know... Lo. I've found a way to live after them. A way to live after a dying mother's counsel? Oh, tell me, tell me how. Well, to you, only to you. Well then, every night in my bedroom, I write down in a little book everything I can remember of what I've said, done, and thought all day, good, bad, or indifferent. Down it goes in my diary. And when I've made a clean breast of it, why then I say my prayers. Indeed. Next morning, the first thing on waking, I read what I confessed the night before. For example now, once I was what you ladies call a flirting girl. At first I wouldn't write it down, but one day it led me to do a false and heartless thing. That very night, down went the whole story in my little book. Next morning, I didn't like to read it, but read it I did, again and again, day after day and week after week. And at last, when I caught myself watching myself, afraid of having such another page as that to write and read, oh, then I knew I was cured. And so, I do believe, the poor motherless, penniless, helpless factory girl has kept herself honest by keeping her diary honest too. Oh, blessings on every school, in every village of the land. And blessings on the simple words over the door, reading and writing taught here. Forgive me, don't I talk more than should be? No. And have you never been in love, Martha? Oh, bless you, I don't say so. I don't pretend I've never looked and said, there, I could be happy. But when I know I can't get there by the lawful high road, I just shut my eyes or look another way. I admire your courage, Martha, but you shall indulge your attachment, for henceforth it is under my protection. Your master, Mr. Stephen, seems the very soul of good nature. I'll speak to him about it. Oh, not for the world. You don't know. My aunt and the company are returning. We will talk further tomorrow. Martha, aside. Tomorrow. Alas, I shall be far away. Company return. Lady Leatherbridge, escorted by Jasper and Fred, right upper entrance. Stephen and Toby come in, left entrance in flat, in full dress. Toby bows all round. Fred, right center. The hour come, and Sir Arthur not come. We must proceed without him. To Toby. My good fellow, desire the carriages to be drawn up to the door immediately. Toby. Right. I fly. Starts off, suddenly stops. Well, why don't you go? I have my reasons. Aside. I thought the trousers were too tight when I put them on. Backs out at right upper entrance. Stephen, left center. Aside to Jasper. Now, Dad, you've had your good forty minutes. Come, your answer about Martha. Jasper, right. What shall I say, unhappy old plum that I am? Fred, advancing. Father, the plan I suggested is the only rational way of proceeding. I know Stephen's character. He will do what he threatens. Let me speak to him. Do so. I give him up. Retires up center. Fred, right center. Stephen, my father has told me all, and he consents to your marriage. Stephen, right. Oh, really? Truly? On one condition, let's have it, that you postpone it for three months, during which Martha shall discontinue work and merely superintend the women. She shall live with us as one of the family, and associate with our friends at home and abroad, and if during that time her conduct prove 
irreproachable and you persist in your determination my father i repeat promises his consent your hand freddy upon the bargain here is mine meantime he exacts secrecy to martha above all what mayn't i just give her a little bit of a hint eh uh no retires up three months lord lord don't i wish the time was come gate bell right hand jasper to fred your noble friend at last frederick running to window yes tis he enter servant door right upper entrance sir arthur lascelles valeria left starting violently aside oh heavens lady leatherbridge aside arthur here enter sir arthur right upper entrance and comes down right valeria left aside yes tis he oh misery martha left watching her lady valeria why what ails you valeria left nothing a little faint keep near me martha fred right my dear friend heartily welcome we began to despair of seeing you allow me to present my father jasper bows to the ground crosses left my bride my lady leatherbridge sir arthur crosses to left centre and bows to all successively my brother toby who gives him a patronizing nod how are you lady leatherbridge right centre sir arthur lascelles can i believe my eyes jasper right to sir arthur what you know the ladies then sir arthur left centre i have that honour bowing to lady leatherbridge right centre that unspeakable happiness bowing to valeria left who starts violently lady leatherbridge aside be still little fluttering heart be still tis strange i was not aware of the acquaintance jasper right aside indeed that certainly is strange frederick retires up to window martha left struck by valeria's manner aside she grows worse and worse and can scarcely stand as he approaches her this must be is the man she loved i am afraid loves still i cannot will not leave her stephen coming down left aside to martha well martha what say you now you'll stay where you are won't you martha eagerly and still watching valeria i will i will aside to be near her in her need jasper crosses to frederick who comes down centre and now my beloved boy take your old father's blessing embraces him i've loved you frederick like my own life your wife will forgive a tear or two at parting wipes his eyes church bells heard at back right work people enter left entrance in flat when stephen and martha exeunt they pass across the stage looking out hark the merry bells invite us my lady leatherbridge the honour of your hand follow frederick with your lovely bride jasper and lady leatherbridge exeunt at right upper entrance frederick awaits valeria left who is apparently unconscious of what is passing at last he passes to centre and touches her hand she shudders and gives it sir arthur wright catches her eye and bows frederick and valeria go out stephen is about to follow them when he turns and sees sir arthur looking at martha left through his glass he runs back puts martha's arm in his and runs gaily out with her at right upper entrance sir arthur surprised at being thus left alone turns and finds toby close to him toby after a pause takes pack of cards from his pocket and presents them to sir arthur take a card sir arthur looks at him with astonishment and exits right upper entrance indignantly Toby follows. Work people laugh. Shouts outside. Arrows! Mingled with the bells. Curtain. End 
of Act One of All That Glitters Is Not Gold by John Madison Morton and Thomas Morton. Act Two of All That Glitters Is Not Gold by John Madison Morton and Thomas Morton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. All the Glitters is Not Gold, Act Two. Scene. An apartment brilliantly illuminated, large folding doors at center, showing a suite of rooms beyond similarly illuminated, large French casement window at right third entrance, door right second entrance, door is left, first entrance, left second entrance, and left third entrance, sofa right, armchairs, and etc. Table with writing materials left. Enter Jasper Plum at center in evening dress. Come, I flatter myself my first assembly opens with satisfactory eclat. Everything I see, everything I hear, everything I touch, everything I smell appears to me to have something distinguished about it. What over there? Ices for the ballroom. Enter Toby at door right, second entrance, with large tray full of ices. He is in livery. Jasper, recognizing him. Hello. How the devil, sir, did you get here? Why, being naturally anxious to witness the festivities on this occasion, and as you forgot to send me an invitation, no apologies, I forgive you, I requested permission of your son, Mr. Stephen Plum, to put on the livery of the plums. Crosses to table left, and places tray on it. And pray, sir, what is it you do? Why, I do the eating and drinking department. I chose it myself, because I felt competent to do the thing well. Jasper, right. And pray, sir, is that all you do? Toby, left. No, sometimes I vary the monotony of the thing by asking people to take cards, or to let me show them a little conjuring. There's one trick, especially, that I'm very fond of doing. I borrow a gentleman's purse, brimful of money, and, in an incredibly short space of time, I return it to him perfectly empty. And what's more, he never sees a farthing of his money again. He retires. Sure. Aside. Well thought of. I may make this fellow useful in carrying out my deep-laid plan. It's now two months since I promised that unhappy boy of mine, Stephen, that I would transfer this uneducated girl, Martha Gibbs, from the factory to the salon. Tonight she makes her first curtsy in a ballroom. Surely there can be but one result. Her head must turn giddy with her sudden elevation, her vulgarity be exposed, perhaps her integrity shaken, and Stephen be cured of his infatuation. I'll set this fellow to watch her. Aloud. Toby, come here. Looking about him mysteriously, Toby does the same. You seem to have a good pair of eyes in your head. Well, I hope they are, because I give you my honour. They're the only ones I've got. Listen, there is a certain person here tonight that I wish you to keep your eye upon. Somebody you think likely to pocket the spoons? Sure. In a word, the individual that I wish you not to lose sight of is your former associate in the factory, Martha Gibbs. Hush! Toby, aside. What's in the wind now? Loud. Ah, yes. By the by, sir, the mill folks say that Martha has become quite a grand lady. That's the point. I wish to know whether she makes a proper return for the kindness I have shown her. You will, therefore, watch her closely, and if you perceive the slightest levity of manner, or the most trifling want of decorum in her conduct, Inform me instantly. Of course I will. Aside. Of course I won't. I know a trick worth two of that. Going to table and taking tray. And now, Toby, take that load of pineapple ice into the ballroom 
and present an ice to each lady at the end of the polka. The polka? Oh, don't talk about it. Dancing the polka, and ending with a pirouette, nearly upsetting the tray. Zounds! Be quiet, and mind you give it with a grace. I hope you give ice with a grace, Toby. No, sir. I generally give it with a spoon. Sure. This is the sort of thing I mean. Takes tray, and presents it with a low bow to Toby. Toby takes ice and eats it. Thank you. Hello. Hello, sir. Well, I don't mind if I do. Takes some cake. Eats. There. That'll do for the present. And now I'll go and take a stroll in the ballroom. Going. Stop, sir, and take your infernal tray along with you. Gives Toby the tray. And, Toby, be sure you present an ice to Lady Leatherbridge, spoon and all. Toby, right. What? The old lady with a sort of yellow towel tied ever so many times round her head? I've given her nine already. She wanted another just now, and I wouldn't let her have it. Going. One word more, Toby. If you should have to announce any one of my guests, Sir Arthur Lassell, for instance, mind you, do it properly. Oh, I know. Announcing. Here's Mr. Sir Arthur Lassell. That's not it at all. Announcing. Sir Arthur Lassell, you blockhead. Now, go along. As Toby goes towards centre, Sir Arthur enters centre from left, meets him, and is about to take ice off tray. Toby, turning away. Well, I think you might have waited till I asked you. Turning to Jasper, and very loud. Sir Arthur Lassell, you blockhead. Exit centre, and left. Ah. Sir Arthur, at last. I beg to apologise, my dear Plum, but Lord Downing, my uncle, arrived at Clifton but two hours ago. Hence my detention. The Cabinet Minister, my dear Frederick William's patron, who so condescendingly attached him to a diplomatic mission to St. Petersburg, and sent him off fifteen days after his marriage, and all thanks to your influence, your solicitations, generous man this devotion to the interests of the plum family is only the more intensely gratifying proceeding as it does from the observed of all observers a man who has turned half the female heads in the neighbourhood aside to him i'll be bound you've got half a dozen little love affairs on your hands at this moment you are wrong coolly it is the great moral principle of my life never to exceed two attachments at the same time only two at a time conscientious man sportsmen say however when you flush a covey aim at only one bird sir arthur right that rule depends upon the game it holds good with partridges not with women listen profess love to two women and you convert them into rivals jealousy begets competition and i need not tell a man of business that competition always benefits the buyer jasper left ingenious creature and i'll be bound you have put your principle into practice with enviable success eh tolerably so and entre nous rather effectively at this moment indeed let me hear great creature let me hear you are irresistible my dear plum well then one of the ladies in question i got acquainted with about two years ago at ramsgate one day during my morning ride i saw a runaway carriage making for the bank of the cliff putting spurs on my horse i succeeded in stopping a career that in a few moments would have been fatal to the carriage including the lady oh i see your heroine number one precisely of course my acquaintance was solicited and the romance promised the most interesting results but unluckily my uncle insisted on my visiting the continent resistance or delay was impossible however on my recent return to england i accidentally met the lady again and although there are now other claims upon her 
which she chooses to fancy sacred i hope to supersede them by means of the other heroine of the story the other oh i remember number two exactly a very noticeable little creature indeed who voluntarily throws herself in my way of course she must be indulged especially as she serves my projects with the other poor little number two i'm afraid you'll sacrifice her to number one enter valeria at centre from left exclaims ah! on seeing sir arthur she is immediately and rapidly followed by martha do you know i'd give the world to see this number one and number two a little patience and perhaps you may seeing valeria right and seeing martha left smiling and looking at each in turn aside here's one and there is the other martha aside yes he's here i feel sure of it jasper center what do you want martha martha assuming naivete nothing i only wanted a rest in here it is so hot in there jasper aside rest in here hot in there poor stephen that ever a son of mine should marry such language as that by the by martha don't forget that my son stephen and i have business early in the morning at gloucester we shall start the moment the ball is over you had therefore better retire early in order to be stirring when factory work begins very well sir sir arthur shows that this arrangement has not escaped him sir arthur write to lady valeria allow me to reconduct you to the ballroom aside to her and earnestly i must speak with you alone hush we are observed loud we shall see you presently my dear mr plum conducts lady valeria out at centre and left martha left aside again together about to follow hey dear miss martha is that the way you take a rest in here because it is so hot in there martha not minding him and still looking after sir arthur he leads her to a retired part of the room she leans on him for treacherous support i'll part them at every risk in spite of him in spite of herself my dear departed mistress help me to save your child exit centre and left well somehow or other i begin to feel a horrible suspicion that my exceedingly deep-laid plan against martha will turn out excessively shallow enter lady leatherbridge hastily centre from left the bold impertinent minx walking to left her ladyship and apparently in a devil of a passion following her the pert presumptuous hussy jasper still walking after her you seem agitated i dread to inquire the cause haven't they given you enough to eat and drink lady leatherbridge left suddenly turning upon him jasper jumps away eat and drink man do you think i'm a woman to be influenced by confectionery besides i've partaken copiously of everything jasper aside i begin to suspect she has loud what is the matter lady leatherbridge loud and suddenly jasper jumps away plum listen there is a certain young woman an inmate of your house report says the affianced bride of your eldest son jasper wright i blush to confess it but only conditionally on the condition solely of her exemplary conduct lady leatherbridge left tis on that point i wish to speak loud again do you sleep with your eyes open never because when awake you certainly keep them shut or you would have perceived long ago the palpable designs of this girl martha upon sir arthur lascelles eh what to-night she has made herself more conspicuous than ever valeria and i have been equally annoyed by her sir arthur can't speak to me but martha answers valeria can't move toward him but martha is in the way in short her behaviour is the common talk of the ballroom jasper wright joyfully you don't mean it 
my dear friend your mortification gives me unspeakable pleasure for if i can only fix this scandal upon the girl's character i shall have the moral satisfaction of turning her out of doors indeed then i'll undertake to furnish conclusive evidence only do that and you'll save the plum from disgrace my son stephen from a coquette sir arthur from a persecution and by the by you seem to take a lively interest in sir arthur too lady leatherbridge simpering oh plum in fact it's quite clear you love him oh plum as a mother lady leatherbridge very loud plum sir i'll leave you to judge of my feelings when i tell you sir arthur saved my life saved your life too aside he seems to have a knack of saving ladies lives can i ever forget that memorable morning at ramsgate when he arrested my runaway carriage on the very brink of the cliff and rescued his letitia from destruction ramsgate runaway carriage brink of the cliff aside gracious powers sir arthur's heroine number one well i must say he's not particular to a year or two doesn't the life that arthur saved belong to arthur don't you observe his incessant attentions is he ever out of the house oh plum you know how easy it is to touch a woman's feelings i do ha <laughs> ha go along do slightly nudging her in the side toby appears at centre from left with his tray jasper and lady leatherbridge look embarrassed it's all right i didn't see anything leave the room fellow enter stephen centre from left toby aside to stephen i say you'd better keep an eye upon your respected sire because i just caught him tickling old leather breech exit toby centre and left stephen laughing very loud <laughs> jasper aside that damned laugh again loud well stephen i've scarcely set eyes on you all the evening how do you like the ball stephen i hope you have been happy and comfortable stephen centre well i can't say much for the comfort dad i don't see the comfort of squeezing folks together as tight as cotton bags but you don't forget the young and lovely women stephen no i don't but there be such a sight of old and ugly ones among em to lady leatherbridge now i don't say that because of you my lady lady leatherbridge left young man jasper right stephen plum stephen centre well don't be angry i'm a-goin i've got to dance jolly old english sir roger to covery i'd ask you ma'am only i'm better engaged engaged to whom to martha i'll be bound you've hit it then i rather think you'll find that martha has got much pleasanter company than sir roger de coverley looking significantly at lady leatherbridge lady leatherbridge returning look yes or mr stephen plum either i'm afraid stephen suddenly serious what do you mean lady leatherbridge significantly nothing nothing then i think it would be just as well to stay what you mean come dad be as straightforward as i be consider your ladyship here out of the way and speak the truth what's all this about martha gibbs she be as good and modest a girl as ever trod the earth i really know very little about treading the earth as i invariably ride but a modest girl may be dazzled by an elegant exterior flattered by attentions especially from a superior to whom she's inferior in a word young man i advise you as a friend to keep an eye upon miss martha gibbs so do i one eye on her and one eye on somebody else and that somebody else sir arthur lascelles the young baronet martha <laughs> very loud jasper aside that damned laugh again come dad and you my lady confess you've uttered a cruel calumny against a poor innocent girl and that you be ashamed of yourselves as you ought to be come confess it to do you good both of you judge for yourself points to martha who enters arm in arm with sir arthur lady valeria escorted by another gentleman 
Male and female guest, center from left. Stephen, aside. Together. Arm in arm. Lady Leatherbridge, significantly. Ahem. Retires to back. Sir Arthur, right center. Really, my good plum, your style of doing the thing is by no means bad. Looking round. Jasper, left center, bowing. My style of doing the thing feels itself highly honored. Aside to him. By the by, I've taken the enormous liberty of making a discovery. I found out who your number one is. Sir Arthur starts. Indeed? Aside. I hope not. Jasper, aside. I have. And what's more, I'm happy to tell you, she dotes on you. In a word, Lady Leatherbridge is yours. With great earnestness. I happen to know it. Sir Arthur, aside. Ha uh ha. -huh. Loud. I see I must be cautious when the eyes of so discerning a person as Mr. Plum are fixed on me. Jasper bows, retires up, and joins the guest at back. Sir Arthur joins Lady Valeria. Stephen left, who has been standing alone and abstracted. I must, I will speak to her. Loud. Martha. Martha, right. Coming to him. Yes, Mr. Stephen. I've just two words to say to you, Martha. Indeed, not now, presently. During the next dance. I hope you remember you are my partner. Oh, yes. I've no objections to make a fool of myself for once, just to please you. Taking her hand, and earnestly. Martha. Observing that she is looking at Sir Arthur, he quietly drops her hand and turns away to hide his emotion. Martha, watching Sir Arthur, and Lady Valeria. He whispers to her again. Ah, oh, that blush, that emotion. I cannot, dare not separate them again. What's to be done? Suddenly. Ah, oh, yes, it shall be so. Loud. Mr. Stephen. Stephen, approaching. Well, Martha. Sir Arthur and Lady Valeria, who are talking apart, advance down stage right. You'll not refuse me a favor. I don't think I could if I tried. What is it, Martha? Why, that you ask your sister-in-law, Lady Valeria, to be your partner for the next dance. Stephen, trying to conceal his vexation. The next dance? Certainly, Martha, if you wish it, only I thought... That you were engaged to me. So you are. Only Lady Valeria is evidently hurt at your want of attention. I see she is. Is she, though? Lord love her, I'm sure I'll dance with her till I drop, and she too. Then make haste. Ask her before she is engaged. Now go! Pushing Stephen. Stephen approaches Valeria, slightly shouldering Sir Arthur to right. Beg pardon, Baronet. Sister-in-law, I understand you want to dance with me. I mean, you understand I want to dance with you. That's it. I'm not much of a hand at it, so if you turn and twist me about too much... Down I go, as sure as a gun. However, I'll do my best. Valeria, aside. How fortunate! I can thus avoid the interview Sir Arthur solicits. Taking Stephen's arm. I assure you, my dear brother-in-law, I am only too happy to secure you for my cavalier. Be you, though? Then come along. Hurries Valeria out, pushing unceremoniously through other dancers, who follow them off with Jasper, center and left. Sir Arthur, right. So, so, she thinks to escape me. Well, let the poor little bird flutter her wings a little longer and dream of liberty. My prize may be delayed, but is not the less secure. I'll not lose sight of her. Here, Lady Leatherbridge puts her arm within his, hiding her face modestly with her fan. Sir Arthur, annoyed, goes out rapidly center and left, dragging her after him. Soft music heard, left upper entrance. Sir Roger de Coverley. Martha, watching him out. Once more I've parted them, and for a short time at least, she is safe. Would that Mr. Frederick were returned. For every hour that prolongs his absence gives hope to Sir Arthur and fear to me. Looking off, center and left. Ah, what do I see? Sir Arthur again at her side. How earnestly he speaks to her. 
And there stands Mr. Stephen, staring up at the ceiling like a great simpleton. And now, now he starts off, dancing all by himself and throwing the whole room into confusion. If I could but interrupt them. Ah, oh, Sir Arthur looks this way, sees me. Shall I hesitate? No, her reputation must be saved, though I risk my own. Perhaps a smile, even from the poor factory girl, will not be lost upon his vanity. Looking off at center and smiling. Yes, he comes. Did he but know how I despise and hate him? Seats herself right. Music ceases. Enter Sir Arthur, center from left. Sir Arthur aside. I was right. She is here, and, of course, alone. That alluring smile couldn't be mistaken. As I have never been made love to before, I am rather curious to see how women set about it. Takes book, seats himself at table left, pretending to read, but keeps his eyes on Martha. Martha, aside. He doesn't speak. Sir Arthur, aside. Not a word. Perhaps a step or two towards the door may assist her powers of articulation. Rises and moves towards door center. Meets Toby, who appears center from left with his tray. Nothing, I thank you. Toby turns and goes out, center and left. Martha, aside. If he leaves me, he returns to her. Aloud. Sir Arthur Lassell. Ah, my good Martha. I wish to speak to you. A few moments are all I ask. You will then be free to return to another. With pretended emotion, Sir Arthur aside. Jealous. Better and better. Aloud. Another, did you say? Martha, with heavy sigh. Hi ho. Sir Arthur aside. Poor thing. Now I look at her, she's really very far from ill-looking. Going up and taking chair left. Toby again appears with his tray, left third entrance. Sir Arthur sees him. Toby turns and goes out, left third entrance. Damn that fellow. Approaches Martha with chair, sits left center. Martha aside and watching him. He remains. I thought so. Loud. The conversation which I ventured to interrupt must doubtless have been very interesting. At least it appeared so, to the lady especially. Nay, a mere string of ballroom commonplaces. Why deceive me? In your earnestness and her emotion, I read my own folly and its punishment. Turns her head away with pretended emotion. Sir Arthur aside so so now then effectually to arouse her jealousy and the victory's mine about to take her hand but stops on seeing toby who again appears at another door right second entrance after a pause toby turns and goes out again right second entrance i shall kill that man presently i'm sure i shall Frankly, then, Martha, dear Martha, taking her hand, she shudders. The earnestness you observed in my manner to Lady Valeria was the natural effect of the language I was addressing her. Martha aside. I must and will know the worst. Aloud. Oh, Sir Arthur, think me mad if you will. But did she, did she say? Unable to continue. Suddenly. What did she say? Sir Arthur, aside. One drop more in her cup of jealousy, and she's mine. Aloud. Her reply is yet to come. Lo. I have solicited an interview tomorrow, and when the ball breaks up, should she consent to meet me she will let the flowers which she carries in her bosom fall to the ground martha imploringly oh promise swear to me that you will not meet her sir arthur more boldly and earnestly on one condition and on one condition only martha hurriedly name it listen martha about to address her in a half whisper 
sees Toby, who appears at the door, left second entrance. Toby turns and goes out again. Sir Arthur watches him goes out, then low and rapidly to Martha, pointing to the window, right third entrance. Yonder casement communicates with the garden. The moment Mr. Plum and his son have left the house for Gloucester, let me find that casement open and you here. On that condition, and that only, I will not meet the lady. Martha, shuddering. No, no. As you please. Lady Valeria may possibly be more compassionate. Martha is about to speak. Nay, I do not require your answer now. Reconsider my proposal, and when the company disperse, should you chance to feel less inflexible, recollect you have just taken your first lesson in the significant language of flowers. Points to the nosegay she carries in her bosom and bows. At this moment, Stephen enters center from left, sees him bow, and stops. Sir Arthur, going out at left third entrance, meets Toby, who again appears with his tray. What the devil do you want, sir? Why, I've been waiting for a considerable time to ask you if you'd take an ice. No. Then perhaps you'll take a card. Be gone, booby. Exit Sir Arthur. Left third entrance, Toby following. Martha aside. An interview with him alone. No, no, I'm not prepared for that. Stephen right, as if throwing off a painful suspicion and rapidly advancing. Martha. Martha, starting. Mr. Stephen. I've been looking for you, Martha, and I was told by more than one of my father's guests that the surest way of finding Martha Gibbs was to look for the man who has just left her. Martha, left. Oh, Mr. Stephen, you do not, cannot suspect. Stephen, taking her hand. I never do suspect, Martha. Where I place my love, there I place my trust. And now, Martha, there's a secret. A secret that much concerns me and somebody else, Martha. A secret that I've had locked up in my breast for these three months past. And an uncommon hard matter I've had to keep it there, surely. A secret? Yes. Taking her hand, and half timidly. I'm... I... I'm going to be married, Martha. At least, I hope so. Martha, with emotion, and withdrawing her hand. Married? You? Don't take away your hand, Martha, but leave it where it is. In mine. As a token and a pledge that you will be my wife. Your wife? Clasping his hand. My wife, Martha. Oh, it's all settled long ago. Dad knows all about it. Freddy knows all about it. And soon everybody shall know all about it. In another week, the three months will be out. And then, Lord, Lord, it won't bear thinking about. The three months? What do you mean? Why? With hesitation. You see, when I told Dad how desperate fond I was of you, says he to me, Harky, Stephen, says he, let Martha know naught of this for three months, and if during that time she does nothing to forfeit the good character she holds, you shall be a husband, and I'll be a father to her. And now, Martha, you have my secret. Martha, with a strong impulse of affection. And you shall have mine, Stephen. I love you. Truly, gratefully, dearly love you. Stephen, clasping her in his arms. Oh, oh. I'm so happy. I don't know what I want to do most, laugh or cry. Lord, Lord, what a wedding we'll have. No fine folks in carriages, no powdered coachmen and footmen and all that gimcrack nonsense. No, no, Martha, we'll walk to church, arm in arm with all the factory at our heels, five hundred of them, and every one with a prayer in his heart and a blessing on his lips for his young master and mistress. Suddenly trying to look grave. But... Don't forget, Martha, there be another week to slip away. And mind, you be a better girl than ever, if that be possible. Guests pass across from left to right. Do not fear. Do add confidence to your love. And whatever you may see, whatever you may hear, trust me, Stephen. I will be worthy of them both. Don't I know you will? Look, 
there be the company breaking up not a word afore dad retires upright i can scarce believe my happiness a few minutes since and i might have compromised myself and lost the greatest joy that life can give the honest love of an honest heart i now renounce the task i had imposed upon myself henceforth lady valeria i can only pray for you enter lady leatherbridge lady valeria and sir arthur centre from left jasper from left where's lady valeria where's lady leatherbridge where's stephen where's anybody where's everybody runs in with open letter in his hand news great glorious news what, what? he's here i mean he will be here he's come back that is he's coming back who, who? jasper centre frederick william my darling son to valeria your husband to stephen your brother brother freddy coming back huzzah i've just received this letter my boy is now on his return to england nay maybe hourly expected here exit centre and left with lady leatherbridge sir arthur aside hourly expected but not yet arrived and i not yet defeated martha right aside and thankfully her husband returns and she is saved valeria left aside and is mine the only heart that feels no joy i cannot dare not will not meet him starting at seeing sir arthur's eye fixed upon her martha right aside and observing her what ails her ah the tempter's eye is upon her she trembles hesitates life and death honour and shame are in that struggle ah seeing valeria drop her bouquet she's lost sir arthur aside i triumph smile significantly at martha martha under strong emotion she stands upon the brink of ruin shall i not snatch her from destruction yes yes i will save her whose mother preserved mine looks at sir arthur and drops her bouquet sir arthur centre aside a double shot egad stephen coming down right picking up martha's bouquet and presenting it to her martha you've dropped your nosegay seeing her hesitate take it martha in a subdued tone affectionately pressing her hand the next flowers you wear will be a wreath of bridal flowers exit sir arthur and valeria centre and left as he is going out sir arthur turns looks significantly at martha and bows to her stephen notices the action and seems struck martha crosses to left aside and shuddering i am sick at heart stephen upright to martha who seems absorbed in thought and gently touching her arm martha the ballroom be nearly empty martha i say martha covers her face with her hands this agitation this emotion what has happened speak martha centre in high excitement i cannot cannot stephen unable to proceed heaven help me rushes out left first exit stephen a long pause this is strange very strange she says she loves me yet when that man returns the very man that i've been warned against she seems bewitched that moment her eyes are fixed on him and, and not one look for me and when i ask her to explain she hides her face runs away and leaves me in this terrible cruel doubt going to left first exit doubt did i say doubt if i did i ought to be ashamed myself well look a light in her room and her door open and there i see her now sitting with her book spread afore her and writing down all she said and done and thought with heaven and her own conscience looking on oh stephen tis the first doubt of her that ever came into your heart and let it be the last ah she rises shuts her book and leaves her room she comes this way i'll take the other passage i must and will read what she has written twas there i first learnt her worth tis there i'll seek her justification exit 
left second exit. Enter Valeria, left third exit. What can Martha mean? Why the mysterious tone and tenor of her words as she passed me hurriedly in the corridor? She begged, implored me instantly to meet her here. Ah, she comes. Re-enter Martha hurriedly, left first exit. Martha left, approaching Valeria. Oh, thanks, thanks. Valeria right, coldly and retiring from her. To the business before us. Why have you solicited this interview? Martha, with animation. To save you from a villain. Yes, lady, if his actions call him a villain, why should my tongue do less? With increasing energy. The man who cheats at cards is struck from the fraternity of gamblers as a wretch too base to mingle even with the base. But what must that man be who tempts a virtuous wife to a game where she stakes all and he stakes nothing? Where she, poor cheated thing madly lays honor, conscience, happiness, heaven itself upon an accursed chance, whilst he has nothing left to lose, not even his worthless character. Valeria, aside. Does she presume to rebuke me? Aloud. I beg to know the drift of this eloquent invective. A little patience and you shall. Aside, and looking towards window. Not yet come. Goes up left and looking towards right window. You seem expecting someone. Yes, madam, one who loves me. At least he tells me so. Ah, oh, that noise. Hurries to window and looks out. My visitor is here, madam. You may perhaps recognize him. Partly withdrawing curtain. Valeria left, who has gone a few steps up the stage. Sir Arthur, tis he. To Martha. And do you presume to say Sir Arthur has asked a secret interview with you? I do. And even pretended love to you? I do. I'll not believe it. You shall hear it from his own lips. Still so confident? If you prove this... Martha, hurriedly. I will. I will. But moments are precious. In... in here... Hurries Valeria into room, right second entrance. The window is opened, and Sir Arthur looks cautiously in. The window open. Then Mr. Plum and his son must have left the house. Martha, are you alone? Yes. Aside. How I tremble. Leans for support on chairs, looking anxiously towards the door at which Valeria has gone out. Sir Arthur enters, then closes the window, at this moment, the door, left third entrance, is cautiously opened, and Lady Leatherbridge looks in. Lady Leatherbridge aside. I was not deceived then. Oh, the monster. Oh, the hussy. Closes door again. Sir Arthur Wright, who turns and sees the motion of the closing door. Tis strange. My presence seems to agitate the very doors. Again. Ah, that glance revealed a petticoat. I am watched, but what jealousy can prompt this espionage? It must be Valeria. Smiling. Then I must change my tactics. Audacity, befriend me. Approaching Martha, and assuming a cold and constrained manner. Martha, you will think me a strange creature, and so I am. But in the fashionable world, one contracts bad habits, and does mischief without intending it. At this evening's ball, for instance, I was betrayed into a tenderness towards you, which, though in every way qualified to inspire it, it is my duty to tell you, you can never create in me. In a loud tone, looking towards the door, left third entrance. Lady Leatherbridge, looking out. Noble Arthur, take that, hussy! Martha, left aside. Have I been deceived? Loud. But this interview, sir, your own solicitation. Was eminently moral, as my explanation will prove. Directing his speech towards door, left third entrance. My dear young friend, 
i have long fancied i observed in you a partiality for my society which however flattering to my vanity honour compels me to suppress loud and pointedly my heart has long been exclusively devoted to a woman whose life i had once the happiness to save lady leatherbridge bobbing at door ecstatic recollection happy letitia the victory's mine and now for revenge upon that huzzy disappears closing door with noise martha aside looking towards door where valeria is i thought to save her and i have completed her ruin crosses to right sir arthur who has observed the closing of the door left third entrance hurriedly approaches it and looks out aside valeria's gone she's mine now for the other a little bombast will do good here hastening to martha and assuming a strongly contrasted manner dry the tears that dim those lovely eyes sweet martha and let your ear bear these riveting tidings to your heart i love you martha right aside what do i hear aloud indeed then your love for another sir arthur left poor a mere lover's stratagem to convince myself of your affection and now sweet martha banish jealousy for ever exert your empire over me and you will find me the slave of your every wish about to take her waist gate bell right upper entrance what noise is that martha running to window a travelling carriage at the door jasper without left what ho oh, john thomas lights here plum's voice the devil fly fly by the garden quick uh, we shall meet again yes yes but fly save yourself save me sir arthur hurries out at window at the same moment valeria staggers in door right second entrance pale and almost fainting leans on chair for support right martha running to her oh valeria dear valeria speak to me forgive me oh forgive me for the misery you have suffered forgive you martha you who have taught me to loathe this heartless hypocrite and love the generous husband in whose face i can now presume to look in whose arms i can now presume to seek shelter forgive you oh martha my endless gratitude is yours speak not gratitude say you will love me lady let me be your friend my sister falling in martha's arms and now dear friend dear sister be yourself again mr plum has this moment unexpectedly returned hark he's here jasper without where's lady valeria this way this way martha looks at valeria putting her finger on her lip enter jasper lady leatherbridge and frederick in travelling dress centre from left frederick right centre valeria opening his arm my husband rushing into his arm dear dear valeria what happiness to meet again do you not think so dearest valeria with deep emotion and clasping his hand in both of hers yes indeed indeed i do they talk apart lady leatherbridge right centre aside to him it's all very well plum but remember you have a duty to perform pointing to martha who is mutely expressing her joy at frederick's return there she stands how demure the little hypocrite looks do your duty plum jasper aside to her you sure of the fact quite then here goes aloud and assuming a serious tone frederick and you lady valeria motioning them to approach the day of your return home my dear boy should have been one of unalloyed happiness to us all but unfortunately it is not so looking severely at martha frederick wright father what mean you lady leatherbridge aside 
Now, now comes the triumph of Leatherbridge over Gibbs. Martha Gibbs. Martha left. Sir? Jasper sent her. You have not been alone since the ball broke up. Martha and Valeria exchange looks. Late as it is, you have had a visitor. Martha, without hesitation. Lady Valeria, sir. The visitor I allude to is Sir Arthur Lassell. I have proofs. You have been seen together. Lady Leatherbridge left center. Yes, I am proud to say I was a listener behind that door. Pointing to left third entrance. Martha and Valeria again exchanged looks of alarm. Jasper to Martha. You are silent, and to think that you, you whom I should soon, very soon, have welcomed as a daughter, should have basely attempted to bring this blight upon the plums. Lose no time in making the necessary preparations for your departure. In ten minutes you leave this roof for ever. For ever? Oh, sir! Burst into tears and hides her face in her hands. Valeria, right, aside. Accused, disgraced, and for me. It must not, shall not be. Aloud. Hold, sir. To Plum. Frederick, right, center. Nay, Valeria, my father is right, for all our sakes. For your sake especially, this unhappy girl must leave this roof. I cannot allow your character to be endangered by any further association with one so undeserving. Martha, aside. This from him? Valeria, aside. She shall not suffer for my fault. Aloud to Fred. One moment, sir, and listen to me. Martha, quickly. Be silent, lady, I implore. You have heard your husband's words. With emphasis. It is necessary for your reputation that I should leave this house. Valeria crosses rapidly and aside to her. Oh, Martha, you cannot think that I will suffer. Martha, aside to her, and taking her hand. Nay, Valeria, the knowledge that you are happy will comfort me when I am gone. One more word. With deep emotion. There is one heart besides your own that will lament me. Tell him when I am gone that I owed a heavy debt of gratitude to a benefactress, and I have paid it. Exit left first entrance. Jasper, center, affected. Somehow or other, I don't feel quite so indignant as I did. Lady Leatherbridge, left center, aside to him. Plum, you're melting. No, no, no. Plum is all stone again. She must, she shall quit the factory. Enter Stephen, hurriedly, center from left, followed by Toby. Quit the factory? Who, Dad? No, no. No anger against anyone the day that my brother comes back to us. Welcome home, Freddy. A hundred and a hundred times welcome. Frederick, right. Dear Stephen. They shake hands heartily. Ah, my good friend Toby. Shakes Toby's hand. Toby, right. Yes, sir. I didn't feel inclined to go to bed. And so, for want of something better to do, I was asking myself to take cards when I saw you arrive. Stephen, right center. And now, Dad, who is it that must quit the factory? Seeing Jasper and Frederick appear confused. Why, Father, brother, what's the matter with you both? Toby, affectionately to Jasper. Ain't you well, sir? And yet, you didn't eat and drink so very much after all. If her ladyship had been poorly, I shouldn't have been so much surprised. Fellow! Hold your tongue, Toby. Seriously. For the third time, Father. Who is it that must quit the factory? You shall have your answer, Stephen Plum. The person just discharged from your father's factory is Martha Gibbs. Stephen starting. Martha Gibbs? But why? Why? Because I have proved her to be ungrateful to me and false to you. Stephen staggering. False? Father, you have been deceived. Someone has been imposing on your simplicity. For you know you be simple, Dad. You... You've been received. I know. I'm sure you have. Deeply affected. I wish I had my poor boy, but her perfidy is undeniable. I have proofs that on this spot, within this hour, she's received a lover, and that lover not Stephen Plum. Yes, young man. Stephen, violently to her. Silence. Stephen, it grieves me to afflict you, but Martha's permitted visitor this night... Sir Arthur Lassell. Stephen Wright. 
Sir Arthur Lassell? Toby writes suddenly. I knew it. I expected it from what I saw. Stephen writes center. You knew it? Crosses to Toby. What? Speak, sir. What did you see? Did you observe any familiarity? Speak? Anxiously. Well, then, I certainly must say my constitutional delicacy was considerably shocked at witnessing the familiarity. Jasper and Lady Leatherbridge, anxiously. Yes, yes, yes. yes. The astonishing familiarity between you and Lady Leatherbridge. Jasper and Lady Leatherbridge turn upstage indignantly. <laughs> well said, Toby. I can laugh now. I will laugh, for I see the plot against me. My father and brother would blush to see me marry an honest girl out of honest love, and they'd do this cruel thing to drive me mad. But I'll not go mad. Martha Gibbs shall be my wife, for she's innocent. I know it and can prove it. Lady Leatherbridge left. Absurd. Stephen, violent. Silence, woman. Toby, write confidentially to her. I would really advise you to put a curb on your parts of speech. Stephen Wright crosses the center. Father, come here, and you too, brother. If I could show you, prove to you, that Martha has for some time past, years perhaps, never laid her head upon her pillow at night without writing down in a book everything that she had thought, said, or done in the day that was gone. Supposing, I say, that this poor girl's diary was placed in your hands, would you? Could you disbelieve what you found written in it? No, I'm sure you couldn't. Such a diary has Martha kept, and here it is. Produces book and opens it. Yes, here's the page she has just written. The ink scarce dry. I had a hard matter to find it in the dark. But though I've not read it, I know that it will justify her. Listen. Reading. During the ball tonight, Mr. Stephen took me aside and told me that he loved me. I did, Dad. I let the secret out. I couldn't help it. Reading again. The next moment, Sir Arthur Lassell came to me, and... and... Suddenly stopping. No, no, it can't be. Proceed, Stephen. Stephen, collecting himself and reading slowly. Sir Arthur Lassell came to me and telling me... Covers his face with his hand. Frederick, reading the book which Stephen still holds in his hand. And telling me he loved to solicited an interview, which I granted. Stephen falls into a chair right, overwhelmed with grief. Valeria snatches book out of Stephen's hand and looks at it, then aside. Not one word that condemns or even compromises me. Dear, generous, noble-hearted girl, you have taught me my duty. Hastens to table left, seats herself and writes. Frederick goes to Stephen and attempts to console him. Enter Martha, left first entrance. She has changed her dress to that of a spinner as in Act One. She carries an account book. Jasper crosses to her. Martha to Jasper. Before I leave the factory, sir, I wish to place in your hands these accounts. You will find I have kept them faithfully. See Stephen, who, at the first sound of her voice, has looked up. Their eyes meet. Aside. Stephen here, and they have told him all. I can bear their scorn, but not his sorrow. Stephen, putting Frederick aside, who endeavors to detain him, and advancing towards Martha. Martha! With a violent effort to control himself. You said to me, not an hour since, Stephen had confidence to love, and whatever you may hear, whatever you may see, trust me, I will be worthy of them both. What I have heard, Martha, I need not tell you. What I have seen, I must tell you. I have seen, written in your diary in your own hand, that after I had told you that I loved you and proved that love by asking you to be my wife, Sir Arthur Lassell, telling you he loved you too, solicited an interview which you granted. I now ask you, Martha, is this true? Has that man been here? Martha, in a subdued tone. He has. Stephen, without looking at her, motions with his hand towards the door center. Oh, Martha. Go. Go. Martha is about to go when she turns, takes Stephen's hand, and presses it to her lips. Then, about to go off, Valeria, suddenly rising, advancing to left center. Hold! To Jasper and Frederick, who are about to interfere. 
One moment, I beg, Martha. Martha turns. Stephen retires up left, and there watches the scene. Valeria, left center, resuming in a loud and decided tone. Martha, I must not, will not, accept your generous sacrifice. Sacrifice? sacrifice? Martha, eagerly to Valeria. Oh, madam, what are you about to do? Valeria, center. My duty. These pages, the poor girl's diary, upon which you have accused, condemned, and degraded her, contain but a portion of the truth. The supplement I have supplied. Placing the book in Fred's hand. Read, sir. Frederick, right center aside. What can this mean? Reading aloud. Sir Arthur Lascelles solicited an interview, which I granted. Now for the supplement. All appear anxious. In Valeria's handwriting. Why do I tremble? Reads. Martha granted the interview, not to indulge her affection, but to dispel my infatuation. This false friend once preserved my life, and reared upon my gratitude the base design of robbing me of all that makes life worth preserving. To save me, Martha tore away his mask, and exposed the features of the selfish libertine. Oh, Frederick, to this calumnated generous girl I owe, perhaps, the precious privilege of thus asking your forgiveness. Turns and sees Valeria on her knees before him, her face buried in her hands, unable to speak, lets the book fall, and staggers to chair right. Stephen, left. She's innocent. She's innocent. Oh, my blessed girl. Oh. <laughs> Rushing forward and receiving Martha, who sinks into his arms. Toby, right, imitating Stephen's hysterical laugh. <laughs> throws his arm around Lady Leatherbridge. Martha, recovering, runs to Valeria and addresses Frederick. Oh, sir, speak to her. Her heart is almost breaking. Frederick, right center to Martha. Noble girl, you are too just to urge me to my own dishonor. Your virtue is my full security that I am not called upon to pardon guilt. Turns to Valeria, still kneeling, opens his arms. Valeria! She rushes into them. No allusions to the past. No word of reproach shall ever pass my lips. Sir Arthur heard without, center and left. My friend Frederick has returned, say you? Frederick, right center. Ah, the villain's voice. Valeria, center. Frederick, for my sake, no violence. Stephen, left. No, Freddy, no violence. I'll just chuck him out the window or something of that sort. Jasper picks up book and crosses left. Toby, right. Or well, suppose we treat him with the quiet contempt he deserves and all pitch into him at once. Stephen turns upstage left and crosses to right center at back. Enter Sir Arthur, center from left. Toby, meeting him and bowing him down. This way, sir. I won't take your hat and cane, because I don't think yours is likely to be a long visit. Sir Arthur, center, looking around the room. Quite a family party, I declare. To Frederick. My dear Frederick, I heard of your arrival, and late as it is, hastened to congratulate you. Offering hand, Frederick is about to assault him, but is withheld by Valeria and Stephen. Frederick, I implore. Stephen, right center, getting between Frederick and Sir Arthur. To Frederick. Be quiet, Freddy. Let me talk to him. If you let me talk to him, I won't chuck him out of the window. There, now. To Sir Arthur, smiling. Yes, sir. As you say, we be quite a family party. There be Freddy and his wife, and there be me and my wife. Here Valeria and Martha pointedly embrace their husbands. And there be Dad and his new daughter Martha. Jasper left, taking Martha in his arms. Yes, the dear adopted daughter, the pride of the house of Plum. Sir Arthur, center aside. They have counterplotted, and I have got the worst of it. 
but i'll mortify them by my unconquerable serenity aloud my dear friends i congratulate you all sarcastically the ladies especially i will intrude no longer frederick advancing one moment sir arthur lascelles but that reflection tells me my indignation will be thrown away rely on it i should have readily found a tongue and weapon to express it you have disappointed me even of revenge the man who is incapable of shame is unworthy of resentment retire sir retire inevitably safe in the contempt and scorn you inspire points to door sir arthur with perfect placidity contempt and scorn well i rarely quarrel with expressions indeed it would be singularly unjust on this occasion for i can assure mr frederick plum and the rest of this refined cotton-spinning fraternity that i take my leave with the most profound reciprocity of feeling bowing low and moving to door ha 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 toby right up stage thundering in his ear <laughs> go to the devil toby points to door after you if you please exit sir arthur centre and right jasper centre shameless to the last taking stephen aside stephen my boy i see that you are right all that glitters is not gold stephen left aside to jasper gold lord love you no dad but pointing after sir arthur they do work up brass with such a polish nowadays it be no easy job to tell one from the other toby returning down stage right well i'm not naturally fond of rascals but i do like that man he's such an out and outer lady leatherbridge right aside i've lost arthur but plum remains to be sure the thing is old and the thing is ugly but the thing has money i'll try the thing loud plum simpering and nodding oh plum jasper center aside i do believe she's ogling me heaven preserve me shakes a decided negative toby wright confidently to lady leatherbridge mr plum doesn't seem to cry about it my lady but if you'll leave me everything you've got when you've gone and go as soon as you conveniently can you'll be at liberty to propose for me Four. flings out centre and left toby follows her up stage and returns down left jasper centre we have shrunk to a narrow circle but i begin to think that the circle of happiness is like one of your factory wheels stephen all the stronger the smaller the circumference bless you all my children bless you all frederick passes to right stephen presenting diary to martha martha look here your diary what will be your next entry in this precious book martha left i hardly know crossing to audience left center hesitatingly but if on retiring i dared venture to inscribe there that we have gained the approving sympathies of the good kind hearts around us that would indeed be the brightest page the proudest line in all the poor girl's diary curtain end of act two end of all That Glitters Is Not Gold by John Madison Morton and Thomas Morton.